your source for business, economy, and development insight that drive nations forward. From the vibrant streets of Lagos, Africa's fastest economic hub, Souk News takes you on a journey of discovery, analyzing and reporting the facts that lay the foundation for growth and development. We don't just report the news, we create it. Souk News is more than a channel. It is a catalyst for change, spotlighting the stories that shape economies, inspire entrepreneurs, and fear progress. Covering business, finance, technology, energy, and many more, Souk News provides a daily deep dive into the stories that matter, interviews with industry titans, and analysis that empowers your understanding of economic landscape. Join us daily as we dissect, discuss, and deliver the most relevant and factual news on business and the economy. Souk News is your trusted guide, empowering you with the knowledge to make informed decisions. We've got just what you need right here at Femi Wash Media. Call it the Midas Touch and you wouldn't be wrong. Let us record, produce, mix and master your audio like nobody does. Reach us on our concert today for the best quality job. Hello and welcome to Souk Pauls. It's always our excitement to be here, knowing fully well that you are part of this particular program wherever you are, and also going on our social media handles and being part of it. We say thank you for those conversations. It's Souk Pauls, and here we look, dive, and openly tell ourselves, it might be truth, it might be false, but we keep talking. We'll tell you some basic things. Hey, what is working, what is not working. When it comes to those loans, when it comes to business, when it comes to policies, when it comes to the economy, what is working, what is not working. Who is saying where are the narratives coming from? True, false, we put it on the table. We talk, we discuss, and we'll tell you this is Suk Pauls, never be quiet about it. My name is Chooks, John Rogers Chooks, and it's my pleasure to be here today. We'll go straight into what we have to talk about today. We don't have much time. We have an A part and we have a B part. And we are still glad we have our guest in the studio, our very own. Okay, we'll go on a break. And I'll get to tell you who he is. Don't go anywhere. Just what you need right here at Femi Wash Media. Call it the Midas Touch and you wouldn't be wrong. Let us record, produce, mix and master your audio like nobody does. Reach us on our concert today for the best quality job. Yes, welcome back. It's still Souk Pauls. Now, economic integration amongst countries is a major platform for growth. And when we say the policies of all those countries, when it work favorably to them, then hey, business and those economies grow. We've seen this play out itself when we look at the West, Europe. What did they come up with? 
a currency, a single currency. Over time, we've seen that it's been positive and it's been a source of business interaction, and that is working. Now, we are coming back to Africa. There has been this particular proposal for a very long time, be it that of Africa, be it those of regions, dates back to 1975, that of ECOWAS. As we speak, it's still on the drawing blocks, and now we bring this to the fore. African single currency. How possible? Is this something that it's visible? Can it still happen? That's part one for today. Then later, after the towards the end of the show, we'll now go back to cashless policy across Africa and ask ourselves some direct questions. What is happening with that policy? It's been tinkered on over time. But first, let's talk about this single currency in Africa. We are looking at blocks coming together. We are looking at across Africa, I have to deal with, let's say, Ghana, and I'm buying something, and I'm finding it difficult to convert Naira to cities. And now both of us have to start looking for a dollar to transact with my next neighbor. Okay, now let's go further. South Africa, that is a must. I have to go and look for dollar. If we can say that there is a single currency, what do you think? How far can it go? Will it help me? Will it help them? So to talk about this, we have our own in-house analyst, Dr. Idausa. Good afternoon and welcome to Super, sir. Good afternoon, Chooks. My pleasure to be on the show this afternoon. Like, is it really your pleasure? Oh, it's my pleasure. You're I'm welcome, honored, sir. I'm honored to be here. You are dressed down for the show. Or are you going somewhere after the show? No, just for this show. Just for us? <laughs> okay. So, sir, let's always start with this topic. This single currency in Africa, is it possible? Well, it's possible uh, if um, we have right leadership in place across the continent. Uh, people who have clear understanding of the issues, we can achieve it. If we have right leadership, right leadership. I, had, I had to write that particular one down. Uh, so uh, what's happening with the leadership we have right now? Yeah, I, I think the challenge that uh, the African state has encountered is uh, the legitimacy crisis uh, of most African leaders since uh, the early days of independence uh, in the 1960s. So uh, we've suffered hugely from crisis of uh, legitimacy in most of African states. And this was also owing to the fact of the way we uh, got independence across the continent. And we saw uh, shortly after the independence, you find that military coups became the in thing in the continent. And therefore, you were having leaders who, of course, uh, had to carry a lot of baggage into maintenance. And because of all of all this, it became really very difficult uh, to focus on the economic challenge that the continent had to deal with. And don't also forget that, of course, this is also because uh, in most of the cases, you also had sort of great leaders who were uh, mouthpieces for the SY colonial masters, and they were actually speaking uh, for uh, those who uh, enthroned them as leaders in Africa in the first place. And we're really not speaking for the continent as it were. So these have been the issue. And uh, in the last three decades, these had not really abated. And that is why it's been difficult to really find um, that uh, common ground among the African leaders. So once you are able to deal with the issue of legitimacy, and then, of course, understand what the issues are and uh, the necessity to build uh, a union which was what uh, Nkrumah was championing. And then, of course, you are having people able to uh, put down their ego and consider the economic imperative over and above political or uh, egoistic considerations. Uh, you find that uh, a single currency is possible for Africa. OK. Uh, when you were saying, when you, when you were giving this analogy, you said something about speaking for their yeah. Colonial masters. That's why and leaders. I'm coming there, but let's just hold that. Have okay. it in mind. I am definitely going to go there. Now, 1975, ECOWAS had a, a treaty. It happened in Lagos, Lagos, Nigeria. And they all signed to it. At that same, that part of that treaty was 
the formation, the creation of a single currency for the ECOWAS zone. 15 countries were part of it. Nearly all West African states were part of it. Now, looking back at that length of time, we will now start asking ourselves, from that particular period till now, okay, let me come back to where I was going to. The people or the past leaders, both past and present, or whoever they were, that were speaking on behalf of whoever was pushing them or probing them, is it that these colonial masters or these colonial lords or these, in quote, lords somewhere don't want this to work? Well, you can understand what that means because um, African uh, uh, as a continent, and if you come uh, to West African sub-region, that we do more trade with our colonial master than we do within ourselves. And so it is a factor of uh, trading with France and then you're trading with a common currency. So France uh, wants to continue to hold on uh, to its uh, uh, portion in West Africa as it was given to them uh, all the day from the Berlin Conference. And so you also have English speaking. And this is a real issue. So there's no significant trade that's actually happening between uh, African or West African sub-regions. So trade is more with your colonial partners. So, so the things you want to do in Nigeria, if you want to do anything with Benin Republic, you have to come through France. And so this is the real issue. So the interest of this colonial master seems to have superseded uh, the economic necessity for this uh, unity. And I think this is the real uh, problem that has been um, facing the continent of Africa. Uh, we're looking for a truly free Africa that, uh, like uh, Krumah said in one of his uh, treaties, is the fact that we only had uh, political independence, but in the longer run, we were not given uh, economic independence, and which was fundamental. Were we for, supposed to be given? Oh, yes. You see, the thing is, is uh, uh, at the point that... It's freedom it, given. Yeah, of course. Uh, no, no, sometimes, yeah, at that time, it was a negotiated arrangement. And this negotiated arrangement, take, for example, in the Francophone states, uh, there were documents that the Francophone states were supposed to sign with France, and this, of course, made the central bank in France the real central bank for the uh, uh, colonies in West Africa. So you have 14 countries who are here, and they have to put their money in Paris, not in, within their region. Now, if you have uh, minerals within your environment, the agreement says, of course, you have to give France the right of first refusal. Now, all of all these things really uh, did not provide that uh, kind of an environment that's enabling uh, for these people to actually own their independence. Because uh, if somebody says, oh, I've given you independence, and then, of course, you're allowed to take decision at your pace. Can I, can I cut you? Now, you say, so, someone say, I have given you independence. Independence, Which yeah. means I can also collect it back. Oh, yes. If it's uh, what I gave you, I can yeah, collect yeah, it. Yeah, but, but yes, uh, because... Then what we, happens to you? Yeah. Why are you quiet? Why yeah, are you yeah. these are the These are the real challenge that uh, many of us uh, uh, in the academia really have not paid huge attention to, to look at it. Uh, in terms of the negotiation of how independence were going to be won. Uh, people thought that slavery ended because uh, there were opposition. No, slavery ended because it was no longer profitable. So uh, holding colonies also became unprofitable to the Eswa colonial master, and so they needed to let them go to some extent. And this is uh, what you see play out uh, in terms of uh, bonding that is happening between uh, this Eswa colonial master and the colonies. So they determine the character of who become the presidents in this country. And you cannot actually sit down to uh, determine who your leader will be, as it were. And the whole process were manipulated to favor the man who was going to uh, be a surrogate to the powers that be that are sitting in Europe. So this was the situation where many African states were, and that was why it was difficult for really to have that kind of economic independence, to actually consider your economic you know, uh, priorities over and above what your colonial masters, who felt that 
uh, you were so inferior to them and you needed a lot of tutelage to be able to get to a certain level of growth. So we didn't own our destiny in our hand economically. So politically, we have somebody who seems to be on the hands of affair, but was also still reporting to somebody else who was more superior and who is giving him guide to do a whole lot of things. And this is the real um, conversation that uh, we've really lost, really sat down to, to engage ourselves with. But yes, we eulogize uh, nationalists and many people who were there at that time, but we also see the level of reportage that they were to these people because they needed to be in London, they needed to be in Paris, and they didn't want to cut those uh, opportunity to enjoy the freebies that come from those systems. And therefore, uh, we uh, left our economy in the hands of these people. Okay, at this point in time, this history that has besieged us, this negative history, are we still living it? Yes, of course, you can imagine that, uh, for example, I, I remember the last election in Nigeria, that we get to get legitimacy from Chatham House uh, before we have to contest. And we see that the person that uh, seems to have been endorsed at Chatham House who become the president of your country. When you have a lot of mass media that are here that should engage mm. with your aspirants, and then we still need to get, get clarification. We need to go and see the Queen or, or King of England as it is now. We need to go and meet the Prime Minister in Britain to get endorsement for us to contest the election in our own land. So these are the things that still confront us. So I, I don't see those vestiges going away as quickly as possible. What if the people say no? Okay. Before, well, of before, course, the people before, have not been able to say no before, for this past uh, before, we get, before we get to the yeah. saying yes and, and no, mm. let's, let's take a look at this, 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 current, this currency issue now. We are looking at 1991. Now we had another same treaty signed in Abuja, but this had to do with AU, African Union, bigger part of the Africa, the whole part of the Africa. Now, they gave a date that by 2028, there should be an establishment of an African Central Bank. Mm. Now I ask the question, Central Bank hosted by who? Central Bank entrusted to who? Central Bank, how is the bidding going to happen? Well, I, I, I think um, uh, we like to copy and paste uh, most policy options as Africans, and we think it because you, if you look at the same uh, trajectory in, in uh, the making of the European Union. There were a lot of strategies that were put in place in terms of this conversation. Uh, there were a lot of resistance among the EU members then uh, uh, to say, oh, because politically some states were very weak and some were strong. And merging this strong and weak state became a real issue until you have one president, uh, the law came out in France and became really very vocal and was advocating for this measure. And what they did was that they didn't really leave it at the uh, 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 conference or the committees of the head of states alone. They actually left it in the hands of the bureaucrats. And this was uh, uh, the central bank in uh, most of the European countries who came about and in 1990 brought out a certain report they called it the Law Report, which was to integrate the European Union, giving three levels of uh, processes where they were supposed to follow. Uh, uh, between 1991 to 1999, before they eventually will have to transition into a common currency. They started from the EEC days to uh, European monetary system, and from European monetary system, they enter into European monetary union, and then from European monetary union, uh, after the Treaty of Maastricht in the uh, Netherlands, they came up with this idea that there was a necessity to start a common currency. So you see, this debate was consistent. It was not something that was one of that you talk about it this year, then after 10 years, something happened, then you come back again. So there were consistent policies that were put in place, and they followed this thing through. And by 1999, uh, they had come to that conclusion that they were going to launch the European uh, common currency. And at that time, they were going to launch, January 1, 1999, they launched it. It was not going to be a currency. The coin and the paper money was not available until 2022, January 1. So you can see that there was a strategy in place to get this thing sorted. Now, when you see what African people are talking, we go to meetings and we have resolutions. But of course, the strategy to be put in place to see how this resolutions that we take in our meetings uh, follow through 
to implementation so that you actually see what you want to do. Those strategies are not there. So when we have our meetings, whether it's the meeting of uh, head of state or the meeting of the foreign ministers or the meetings of the central bank of or defense ministers, or of ministers, it's always a jamboree and it's one that happens every annually. And there are no specific uh, KPIs that are put in place to be measured to see how we are doing and see how this integration can really fully take place. So this is the uh, real issue. And of course, don't forget also the struggle for supremacy between the African leaders. Uh, look, when, of course, uh, not, not just African countries right now, but African leaders. African leaders, yeah. You remember that uh, during the days of Nkrumah, he was actually the first advocate of the United States of Africa. And he pushed this agenda until he left government. And one of the issues that, of course, um, Nkrumah was... Until he left government or until they pushed him out? Uh, he, until he left government, whichever way, but at least he left. So uh, until he left government, he was pushing this agenda strongly of a United State of Africa. Now, but you see, the fact was that there were so many personalities who felt that they were so strong at that time. People like uh, Leopold uh, Senda Senghor, you have people uh, like, um, uh, uh, what is his name now, the former president of Uganda. A lot of people take personality in Africa. So the question was to be that, if we have a United States of Africa, who is going to be the president? So it's likely that Nkrumah was campaigning for himself. So that was why it really didn't work and until the coups came, and of course, which of course we know again, we are orchestrated uh, from external powers to actually push this men off power. And then of course they left power. Now after that time, the only single person who also again championed this United States of uh, Africa was uh, Muhammad Gaddafi of um, Libya. Libya. He was at the forefront to see that Africa needed to unite against the powers of the West. But unfortunately, a lot of people became suspicious because they felt that Muhammad Gaddafi was power drunk and uh, he just wanted to become the military dictator for the entire of Africa. So this uh, mutual suspicion among leaders has actually made it very difficult for the AU to sit down around table and negotiate uh, this economic platform that we are talking about. So we are having issues of trust amongst states Amongst, right amongst oh, ourselves. Yeah. Will I say trust amongst states or trust amongst leaders? No, of course it's the leaders, really. It's a trust among the leaders because uh, the people who are there, uh, the bottom range of the ladder, really do not uh, have anything to lose uh, of who become the head of state or who become this thing. But you see, uh, if you are looking at issue, uh, the OAU need to be able to transition, for example. Uh, we need to develop a constitution that will bind us together. Now, the starting point is actually to see that the Anthony Generals of these nations come together and sit down with the uh, leaders of the monetary policy, for example, the CBN group. So everybody sit down and we look at our peculiarities from the east to the west to the north and then uh, to the center and we say, oh, what are peculiarities? What are the things that we need to preserve in this union as uh, unique to us as individual states? Then these things are articulated in the form of a constitution that will bind us together. And once that document is ready, everybody know what legal uh, terms that is keeping us together in this relationship. Then once this is ratified by the state uh, 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 national assemblies, then of course you can put them into effect. But these structures are not in place as we speak. So all we hear is uh, oratory by some leaders who say, oh, we want to be united, but we are not deliberate in terms of putting structure in place to get this happen. Talking about being deliberate, let's look at recent happenings as it concerns this single currency. In the last, in the last one week, in the last few days, countries that are either trying to pull out of be it regional bodies or African bodies. Let's also look at conflict within the African zone. Does it in any way hamper this particular exercise in getting this currency? Yeah, but we have those uh, issues. Uh, those are the things we're speak speaking to. The, the, the African continent since independence has been riddled with a lot of crisis and conflict. And so we spend more energy trying to deal with the conflict situation in Africa. And of course, again, like I said, this of course has heightened suspicion, depending on which side that you are in, in this whole conversation. You see, and that's why a whole lot of people feel that for Africa to actually unite, Nigeria needs to get things right. And, and that is because... Must it be Nigeria getting things right? Oh, yes, because Nigeria, Nigerian hold the key 
to African unity. What if others get it right and put Nigeria to shame? Yeah, but it is going to be very difficult, and that is because of the strategic position that Nigerians occupy. Number one, in terms of... Don't you think we are giving ourselves <laughs> too much accolades? No, no, I'm not sure it's we, really. I have told you on this show before, in 1972, when the non-aligned government uh, met, and everybody was talking. The, prime, the, the vice president of India at that time actually said that the non-aligned movement or the non-aligned states were all looking up to Nigeria for leadership. And so you can imagine at that time that, uh, that Brazil, uh, uh, India, which of course seems to have been more advanced to us in terms of uh, quality of education, were looking up to Nigeria for leadership. And this is because strategically God has positioned us in such a way, had given us population, which is of course larger than every other, because we are the real market, which people want to assess. Now, we also have the privilege of a whole lot of natural resources that God has endowed us with. And we also have the privilege of having very cerebral individuals who are making records everywhere. So this is given. I, I remember speaking to a friend of mine in Kigali that day and said, look, you guys are very lucky because they in uh, uh, Rwanda, they are not as lucky as we are. That there's uh, virtually any corporate body significant anywhere in the world today where you will not find in Nigeria at a decision-making level. And this also gives credence to the capacity of our people. So this is, every African nation know this. And it's not as if we are uh, uh, arrogating this power to ourselves. So but what it means is that we must get our art right. And once we can fix our economy, then we can ask a lot of people to plug in into the economy. And this is what we need to do. And that is why, really, some of all these things are dragging. You see, uh, if you... So, some, okay, some of these things are dragging, okay. yeah. If, if, I you, follow, if, I, if I follow your, your logic and reasoning, then am I free to say that Nigeria is putting Africa to shame? I, I think so, really. I think so, really. You see, because, because on, we have on, not been deliberate... When you say we, be, define we. No, I mean Nigerians. Okay, Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigeria or Nigerians? Nigeria. Okay. Nigeria as a country. Okay. Now, if, if you look at our foreign policy issues in, in, in the world, uh, Nigeria seems to say that, of course, uh, we operate the three concentric uh, circle of foreign policy, first West Africa, then Africa as a whole, then, of course, globally. Now, when you look at the role we have played in the foreign policy globally, or whether in Africa, or whether even in the region, you find that we have not been able to earn the respect of even little countries that we struggle to bring out of trouble. Take, for example, look at the huge role I will, and investment. Hold on. I will want to ask you why, why, okay. why this is happening. But before then, let's go on a break. Super Pauls will be right back. Hey, don't go anywhere. It's getting interesting. Remember, we're still going to talk about cashless policy. But first, Let's arrest this single currency issue. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. We've got just what you need right here at Femi Wash Media. Call it the Midas Touch and you wouldn't be wrong. Let us record, produce, mix, and master your audio like nobody does. Reach us on our content today for the best quality job. The National Theater, Igomu. Built during the military regime of Olusegun Obasanjo and finished in the time for the Second World Festival of Black Arts and Culture. Festac in 1977. The theater holds amazing treasures and memories. The artworks fill everyone with pride. The National Arts Theater is visible from the motorway which connects Lagos Island and the mainland. The National Theater is packed with the artworks of a legendary contemporary Nigerian artist, stained glass wars by Yusuf Grillo, Sculptures and murals by Lamidi Fakeye, Erabo Emopai, and many others. It was put to full use for a month 
as one of the four venues of the second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, tagged Festag 77. The complex hosted 16,000 participants from 56 African countries and the diaspora in an unprecedented showcase of African music, fine art, literature, drama, dance and religion. The National Art Theatre was built and designed by Techno Experts Tro, a Bulgarian company mirroring the Palace of Culture and Sports in Varna, Bulgaria. Completed in 1976, the building is one of the largest and most beautiful of its kind on the African continent. It consists of a central hall with 5,000 seats, a collapsible stage that can be quickly rebuilt, a conference hall with 1,600 seats, two large exhibition halls, and two cinemas with 800 seats each. The theater complex has a dressing room for artists, a garage, offices, coffee bars, and a buffet. It has indoor TV and radio systems, as well as booths with facilities for simultaneous translation of languages and hectares of lush green lawn around. The majestic structure sits in Igomu like a quiet mountain, mesmerizing visitors and passers by. The National Theater Souk Enlightenment. Hello and welcome back to Souk Pulse. We are still looking at discussing single currency in Africa. We are asking ourselves how possible, looking at the time this has taken, from signing of treaties and charters well over 45 years ago for that of regional bodies, owing to getting that of Africa as a whole done. But as we speak, we have not gone beyond those particular signatures that was put on paper. It's still there. And Dr. Udahosa has told us, it's year in, year out. The leaders meet, they mount it, they go and wait for the next year. Now, we were saying something about Nigeria pulling its weight in the region, in Africa. And you were telling us, should I say it, should I call it respect or should I call it yeah, yeah, what is what, due? What, what, I, what I was uh, uh, pointing at is that uh, if you look at the history of uh, relations, uh, Nigeria, uh, the role, the key role that we are playing in Africa, from the liberation uh, of the apartheid South Africa uh, uh, to the stopping of the crisis in uh, Syria alone, in Liberia, and uh, all of the effort that Nigeria has put in to ensure that Africa remains at the core of its policy. Now, there have been no um, a commensurate gesture from this smaller nation. In why terms why of, call them smaller nation? Oh, yeah, the nation are, is a nation. Yes, the nation is a nation. But in terms of resources, in terms of um, uh, population, in terms of land size, they are small compared to us. They are taking uh, care of their people. Yeah, but they are taking care of your people. Yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. What I'm saying is that, yes, of course, they are taking care of their people, but they are relying heavily on new funding what they are doing. And then, of course, you're putting money. Can you imagine what Nigeria commits to ensuring that Ecomong stopped the war in Liberia and in Syria alone? So that was huge. Uh, if they are as big, they could have solved their problem. But Nigeria had to fund it and they ensured and the use of men in developing these states. Now, also see, of course, technical assistance that Nigeria has been availing the entire African nation for the past uh, how many years uh, we give technical support there were times that we send our judges to some of these african countries to go develop their judicial system nigeria have done all of all this and we have invested so much look at even the freedom fighter that we're in south africa of course we house them in nigeria here and ensure that that victory was won but you look at the way we are treated by these nations that be okay. because that, is it not a two-way thing no, no, no. Yeah, that is what I'm saying. We are not strategic in our relationship. We are not strategic in our relationship. So we're just throwing money around. Uh, people see these things that this money are tied around issues. 
You see, there's a way that you have to negotiate your way into prominence. And to say, yes, this person is having this problem, this person is having this problem. We are going to join you to fight, but this is what we want to happen. That we are doing this because we want to achieve a certain goal in the region. And we need your support to be able to do this. So you can enter into that covenant while trying to solve their problem. But when you are not strategic this way, and you just go there and fight, and then after fighting, you hand over power to whoever that is in power. And then they really don't consider that you have done any significant thing. So this, for me, is where, of course, our foreign policy, for example, has failed. So if we, if we move beyond there, and you will see we would have been able to galvanize the rest of Africa based on the resource that God has given to us, and say they will, we call the shots like the U.S. is doing in their region. But of course, this is not working because those who have also managed the uh, foreign relations for us have not been themselves strategic in dealing with some of all this issue. And most of the time, we also get embroiled in the um, turbulence that was also going on. Though we said we were not aligned uh, up to a point, but actually uh, that was uh, in paper. Because actual practice, we actually were aligned. And we were not open uh, in terms of policy options to things that were coming from the East. And therefore, uh, we were more disposed to take things from the West. Imagine that prior independence, Russia, for example, who had perfected the technology for producing iron under Stalin, we are extending a hand of fellowship to us as a country to say, well, we will come and build and give you all the support you need to build your... Steel uh, you're still uh, a fortress, and we turn it down, and then, of course, subletted this thing to France, and then, of course, France subletted to Russia to okay. build for us. So even when we're advocating that we were not aligned. So this misalignment of policy direction, especially in dealing with foreign countries, is really what we have not done well, and that is why we have not been able to mass Africa together into a one single entity. We've now, if we, were, part. if we were... Uh, taking the lead, okay, uh, no, and it was not Nkrumah at independence. Probably a lot of people would have listened to us. But Ghana was so small compared to most other African countries, and so people feel that Nkrumah was so ambitious, and therefore the necessary support he needed was not given. But we didn't have Nigerian leader who deliberately to say, yes, this is our foreign, poli foreign policy direction, and we want to front load what we want to do in terms of putting African together. Okay, and as it stands now, okay, let's not go there. Let's come back to the African Free, the African Free Continental Trade Agreement. Now we are asking and looking forward to having this work. It's just by the corner. Two years from now, implementation is still not far. Now, if we are saying open up borders, open up trade, how are we going to start dealing? Are we going to deal in cryptocurrency? <laughs> or are we going to start, uh, start keep looking for the dollar or the yen or the pounds to be able to deal with each other? Yeah, but that's why I said to you, we don't need to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Uh, Europe has done this. In their early stage in, uh, in, in getting to the Eurozone, what they actually did in the uh, European monetary system days was to determine what the rate of exchange was Amongst the various currency. For specific markets. Yeah, for the markets. So, you know, generally for entire Europe. And they agreed and said, okay, this is how we are going to trade our currency within the market. And so it was accepted by everybody. So we can do that. The central banks can come around. We have seen redenomination of currency. When you, in, say, um, when you in, say central banks come around, are they coming around for a single currency or coming around to determine? You see, what we have to transition. Tra we have to okay. transition to the single currency. We cannot just say today we are going to implement single currency, and okay. and that's the route that we have been taking. That is not that is not nowhere. We need to first of all take this thing, and that's why I'm talking about strategy to see how we're going to move gradually toward the. Uh, announcement of that single currency regime. You need to tell yourself that, okay, what am I going to do in the next two years, in the next five years, okay. so that we get to that point and get everybody ready okay. hold, to hold, accept hold, this. Hold on to that. Uh, now, within the plan, within the plan of this African single currency, there were plans to start regionally. 
ECOWAS, the East Block, the what's it called, the Arab Block, that has not that that has not materialized. Although the Arab side of Africa have a bit of the currency that they use amongst themselves, even if it's not something that is well accepted outside their own block. But right now, if we say single currency, where are we going to start? People's currency, some countries, their currency is, is valued at this, tomorrow is valued at that, is fluctuating, highly fluctuating. So how are we going to deal with that? Yeah, but, but I, I don't think, that's why I'm talking about strategy, because strategy is everything. Now, if you have a good strategy in place, you can actually overcome some of all these issues. Take, for example, we are having about up to 20, uh, 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 say 14 francophone states as it is currently. And you are having six in the West African sub-region, you are having some in uh, the uh, East Africa, some of course uh, toward the North Africa. You have francophone states that are French speaking. Now when you look at it, they are using common currency. Take for example, the CFA franc had been fixed since 1919, since the day Euro was born. The exchange rate of CFA franc to euro has remained the same. It has not changed. So this is the point I'm making. So if for 25 years, euro exchange rate to uh, CFA remained the same, it has not been altered by the CB, uh, CBN of any of this country. So why are we having difficulty integrating ourselves? So this is where the trouble is, because you can't just say, okay, go and unite. No. That won't work. You see, the whole template should be that we are working toward an African Union. And when you are working toward African Union, the sub-region become a secondary form of contradiction that are likely to pull you backward. So we should be able to say as Africans that we're going to trade as African. I think that is what it is. Because we have not seen any significant integration within the Union. So what Europe did was to overlook all the fragments and then they focus on the central Europe where every country is involved and every country policy is down. We have given ourselves targets. We brought all currency to the table. So what we would have simply done is that we bring CD to the table, we bring the CFA franc to the table, and we bring Naira to the table, and probably the RAND from the Southern Africa. So once we bring all this currency to the table, and we will determine what, at what rate are we going to exchange. So that if I come to buy something from South Africa, for example, I, they should be able to take my Naira. And if they come to Nigeria, we should be able to take they are around at a certain exchange rate. And then, of course, we allow this currency to trade within each country for the purpose of exchange. And then, of course, you now see that you are facilitating trade. Then, of course, the argument for a single currency becomes valid. But as, we, as it is now, there is no trade going on. So what do Between you us. So, so why do we need a single currency? Okay. Let's still hold on to this thought. We can continue this later. Now, let's talk about some other thing. We have a plan B, a part B to this particular day. And we're looking at the cashless policy. Some years back, long, it's not just years, some very long years back, this particular policy was introduced in Nigeria, majorly to try and curb corruption. That was the reason that was given, to reduce the amount of printing of notes that was costing the government, and to be able to get money to the banks so that the banks can get money to business ventures and needed those particular money. And also help government monitor money movement. At this point in time, can we say that that has been achieved for Nigeria? Well, uh, to a very large extent, I think the cashless policy is working. And um, those goals, as it were, uh, intended are uh, being uh, met, met somehow. Uh, yeah, of course, you still see a whole lot of volume of cash transaction, and that's because of the rate of enlightenment. And that's because, again, we have not fully embraced technology to drive the entire process. Take, for example, if you go to places like uh, Rwanda, and you see that the whole system is integrated into E. People who sell in the market, if you enter a cab, if you take a motorbike, you can actually do 
a USD transaction without really necessarily needing a data to operate. So this is what we have not done. One young man uh, brought out a small technology they call the Momo technology, and this, of course, worked for Rwanda that everybody accept an exchange. All that I just need to do is that I do a transaction for you. I don't need to have cash. But that's not to say that cash, are no, cash is not moving in Rwanda, but is an alternative to the cash exchange. Even in Europe, we're talking about, they are still using cash. In America, there's also dollar in the street. So it's not as if that there's a system anywhere in the world where you don't see cash. And this is where, again, um, uh, our CBN also had not done well in terms of really thinking in making this policy as effective as possible. Now, what most system in the world has done is to reduce the value of either the paper money and emphasize a whole lot on coin. Now, when you go to America, you hardly will see a 200 euro, a dollar B. What you see is a hundred dollar B, you see a fifty dollar B, you have a five dollar B, you have a one dollar B. Now, when you go to Eurozone, you see maximum is 200 euro. That's what you see. You don't see any denomination that is higher than that circulating. Because the motivation for people to hold money is the fact that you have a denomination that can be as compact as possible. So once you make uh, your re-denominate re your currency, and that was one of the arguments I had some time ago in terms of CBN failure when, of course, we did the Naira denomination. That they didn't need, they didn't, there was no need for us to preach 1,000 notes or 500 notes or even the 200 note. All that the government needed to do was to say, oh, we are redesigning the currency and therefore tactically withdraw the hard denominational notes in the name of uh, redesign, and then allow the 150, 20 naira notes to circulate alongside coin. Nobody would have heard anybody uh, 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 to ransom. There would have been any need for anybody to go to court. This would not have happened, but CBN didn't think about this, and therefore they made room for the hoarding of currency to happen because they were printing uh, big denomination. Nobody would have cried because if you go to ATM and all you find in ATM is 200 Naira notes or uh, 2020 20 Naira notes and then you pump the machine, it brings out 20 pieces for you and that of course is what you are going to take. So you won't need to carry one Ghana must gold of currency. So if you have transaction that is above 2,000 or 5,000, then you have to do it online. This we didn't do and that is because again uh, strategy was not in place to actually implement uh, the real denomination and then allow the cashless policy as it was designed to reach its optimum. Okay, now this cashless policy as it was designed, will you say it has some way stopped, reduced the level of crime like robbery? Well, that Death obviously. Of people, of families, of uh, shops. Yes, obviously. Of businesses. Obviously. It has. In short, I, I used to tell people that when you look at our history and see the transition, you see, in the early 80s, in the early 90s, armed robbery was the order of the day. People were moving from house to house because there a lot was, of people were keeping there money. Was cash, there was money in the yeah, house. Yeah, there was money in the house. But when you see what happened in the late 90s, people were not having cash in the house. And most money was in the bank. And so armed robbers go to the house and they don't really get value. So you see a, a new uh, form of crime evolved. And that was why you see the cyber crime in the early mid 90s uh, to the early 2000s. We had a lot of forward nights because money were not in the house and there were no motivation for people to carry guns to go to the places to rob. The only place they could find money was in the bank or in the vault. So going from house to house uh, was no longer really possible. Now, they started this internet stuff, and then we got to a okay. point that a lot of people are getting Before, aware of these issues. Now, what are you seeing? People say, okay, we do kidnapping or we do something. Yes, Hold somebody are, you, are, you, are you giving us history or a chain rundown on crime? Yes, I'm just giving you the chain rundown on how crimes have evolved, even in our nation. Okay, now let's leave that alone and talk cashless <laughs> policy. Yeah, but it's part of it. What I'm saying, in essence, is that to a very large extent, is to say that the cashless policy has actually achieved its goal. Okay. It is goal that uh, money, which of course was the major motivation for crime, 
which of course this is the robbery kind of crime that people come to people's home and of course rob and take cash away that has stopped and abated to a very large degree so you don't see people really coming to the house now to say they want to come and rob but because now, they know that you let's, are, let's, the chances of having money in the house was remote. Okay, now let's also look at this particular one. Government being able to track money and movement. Well, again, um, I, I think uh, the ability to track money for government today is not a problem. Except for the conspiracy of the elite. It, that's what is making it look as if government cannot track. CBN know who has money and where the money is passing through. Are you, are, you, are you referring to money in the bank or money in the house? Movement of money. CBN know is moving money from where to where? From the bank to bank or from house to wherever? Yeah, of course, if you, if you put deposits in the bank today, whichever bank you put it, CBN knows that, of course, the transaction has account. They yes. should know. Now, what about for those particular monies that are not domiciled in the bank? You see, there's little money that is not domiciled in the bank. It's, there is a lot of money that is moving around. But what you find really, uh, in some people, maybe for religious purpose, may not be, do, uh, 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 may not be uh, domiciling their cash in the bank. But I think it's insignificant. Most of the money that are moving around is the fact that uh, some people are giving cover to some certain people, maybe because of the certain role uh, they occupy in their scheme of things, and uh, they decide to allow this thing to, to just slip by. Why is it difficult for us, for example, for CBN to enforce uh, uh, the institutionalization of BVN, for example, where every account are linked to BVN and they are linked to your NI. But why, is it, but, why is it difficult? But, but, the, but the, the accounts are linked. Yeah, no, no, on many, paper no. Or on book? Yeah, on paper. Okay. You see, on now, paper they are linked. And that's why you are seeing that there are a whole lot of people we are now talking. And of course, uh, this new CBN is saying that they want to do a whole lot on regulatory uh, 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 work, that of course, uh, which is their core mandate. And we are hoping that the steps that they are taking, that by the end of this month, month of March, any account that does not have PVM verified, those accounts should be shut down. Should be shut. Okay. So, now, lastly, so this is the issue. Lastly, before we leave, um, let me say that you are the next head of AU, African Union. AU, African Union. I'm right, yes. Let's say you are the next head of AU. In one sentence, if you support the single currency, or if you don't support it, what will be your action? Well, it's simple. Stakeholder engagement. Stakeholder engagement. Now, you see, when you are initiating change, you should understand, of course, that there are going to be likely resistance. And you are going to look at where the resistance are likely to come from and know who has real um, latent power to enforce resistance. And then you start engagement from that level and put a whole structure and template for pre-change communication, change communication, and post-change communication. Now, once those structures are put in place, then, of course, we start the engagement. And then you'll be able to get the significant buy-in to launch this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dahosa. It's always a pleasure having you on Soup Pauls. All my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Thank you. Now, to all of our viewers, we want to say this. We believe Africa can move forward, and we believe in this single currency for Africa because we see possibilities. Wherever you are, wherever you reside, whichever country you are, talk, push, and let's get this going. Thank you very much for being part of the program today. My name is Chooks, John Rogers Chooks. Let's do this again tomorrow. Bye.